Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next mm, maybe half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you about things that uh, I think are important. Uh, I'll tell you at the top that this is liable to be a rather truncated version of the show because I've been feeling kind of under the weather the last couple of days, um, which is actually a pretty odd expression when you think about it you know, under the weather, because I'm figuring out that the next time I feel really good and somebody says, how are you? I'm going to say I'm over the weather and just see what they say. Anyway, I'm going to start, as I always like to, with some good news. I uh, don't have a lot about this. This is going to be... I'm going to have to talk about this next week because I don't have a lot of the details because this just happened this morning. Uh, A federal judge in Kentucky has ruled that the state of Kentucky's ban on recognizing same-sex marriages that were performed legally in other states is unconstitutional. So it means now, at least in Kentucky, which is now one of 10 states where this has happened, that um, if you are married legally in, for example, New York, and you move to Kentucky, you're still married. So that's good news. But um, I actually have two other stories, two related stories, uh, which are kind of feel-good stories to start with. At least they make me feel good. The first of these comes from Wisconsin. Now, way back in August, I told you about the solidarity sing-alongs. This is where people were singing protest songs, protesting the various anti-worker policies of Governor Scott Walk All Over You. Uh, They were singing in the rotunda of the state capitol building in Madison. Well, at the time I first told you about this, Walk All Over You was getting tired of this, and he was starting to have people arrested as an illegal assembly for singing in the rotunda. And in fact, people who were just standing there watching other people sing were also being threatened with arrest. Ultimately, about 400 people were arrested under this. Now, all of those arrests have been struck down. A state judge has declared that the administrative rule used for the arrest is unconstitutional. Quoting, and I love this quote, the judge quoted from an earlier case and said, quoting that case, an unconstitutional law is void as is, uh, as is, and is as no law. An offense created by it is not a crime. A conviction under it is not merely erroneous, it is illegal and void and cannot be a legal cause of imprisonment. So, let the singing continue. My other feel-good story comes from North Carolina, where Moral Mondays are back. Now, I mentioned this uh, three or four times. Uh, The first time was like last July, I think it was. Uh, The Capitol grounds in Raleigh had become the the site of weekly protest and nonviolent civil disobedience on a variety of topics, ranging from Medicaid expansion and unemployment benefits through natural gas drilling and school vouchers to voting rights and abortion rights. Depending on the topic and on the weather, the crowds had numbered anything from dozens to thousands. Well, these marches were suspended for a while when the legislature of North Carolina was not in session, but now they are back, and they are back big. A rally was held on Monday to mark the anniversary of one of the founding actions of the Civil Rights Era, the day when four black college students sat down at a lunch counter in a Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, at a whites-only lunch counter, and asked to be served coffee. Uh, this, uh, this actually, this rally to mark the anniversary of that event drew an estimated 80 to 100,000 people. This is the largest civil rights rally in the South since the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. And the fact that people are carrying it on, carrying it on in places like Wisconsin and North Carolina, where they've had to absorb so many body blows over the last several years, that these people have not only absorbed these body blows, but they are fighting back that just makes me feel hopeful and it makes me feel good. It's all good news. So moving on from there, still in our lighthearted vein, we have another example of our occasional feature, unintentional humor, where something that's not intended to be funny um, just is. This actually comes uh, via a good catch by the media watchdog group FAIR. Time magazine apparently just published a long piece about French President Francois Hollande. 
Uh, the piece makes the very predictable argument that his recent turn towards the right is a good idea because in the minds of the so-called mainstream media, moving to the political right is always a good idea, no matter the circumstances. In this case, according to the article subhead, quote, the world needs him to succeed, which, of course, in their minds, placating and embracing the right is sure to accomplish. All right, but here's the thing about this. Here's the real thing. This is the first paragraph of the story. French presidents don't so much govern as reign from the splendors of the Elysee Palace. They have powers most democratic leaders only dream of, able to deploy their military or command nuclear strikes without first consulting the national legislature. So in France, the president can take military action without consulting the legislative branch of government? Really? What a singular place that must be. I can't imagine any other president anywhere daring to claim that they had that kind of power. Like the man said, sometimes you laugh just so you don't cry. By the way, one other thought on this. Has Time Magazine ever heard of drones? All right, moving on from there. Uh, I've got an update on the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. Although, actually, I should probably call this a follow-up rather than an update, but, you know, what the heck. All right, a very quick reminder. The Keystone XL pipeline is this pipeline, the proposed pipeline, that would move tar sands oil, which is the dirtiest, most polluting way to get oil there is, move it from a huge pit in Alberta, Canada, through a pipeline across the prairies of the United States to refineries in Texas, where after being refined, it would be sold in the international market. Now, I talked last week about the State Department report on the pipeline and how supporters were trying to rep uh, spin that report into something that essentially required it be approved uh, and quickly approved and we're trying to spin this despite the report's actual serious shortcomings. Uh, the biggest shortcoming uh, actually being how it, the report tries to avoid the whole question of the major and if you will, majorly bad uh, effect on global climate will result from an expansion of the production of tar sands oil, even as the report is forced to admit that this pipeline will do precisely that. The, uh, because This is because the effect on the climate, uh, the report admitted, the actual o overall effect would be like pumping the exhaust from an additional six million cars into the atmosphere. But the report tries to develop that uh, it, it'll have little impact on greenhouse gas because all it compares is the means of transmission. Saying if it's not transmitted by the pipeline, it'll be transmitted some other way, so what difference does it make? Well, it also turns out that that contention is not supported by Canada's uh, government and industry officials. In fact, Ross Gerling, he's the CEO of TransCanada. This is the outfit that would build and actually operate the pipeline. He said that developing tar sands will be set back, quote, for decades, unquote, if new pipelines are not available immediately. So even they're saying that turning down this pipeline will, in fact, restrict and hinder the development of this incredibly polluting energy source. But the thing is, what I wanted to mention here, today is another part of that State Department report which I think has gotten less attention than it deserves and that's the matter of jobs. Now all along supporters of this project have been claiming that it will create untold tens of thousands of jobs and all along their predictions have proved to be wildly inflated. For example in 2012 TransCanada was claiming that the project would, quoting, create 20,000 construction and manufacturing jobs in the U.S., as well as 118,000 spin-off jobs, so like 140,000 jobs they're saying would create. However, a year later, those 20,000 construction jobs, they had shrunk to 9,000, less than half as many. All right, so what does the State Department report say about jobs? It claims that during construction, the project will support, and remember that word, it's an important word, the project will support a total of 42,100 total jobs, direct, indirect, and imputed, which sounds reasonably impressive until you actually get into the details.
First off, direct jobs means those people who are actually be employed in building the pipeline. There will be about, the State Department estimates, 3,900 such jobs. Uh, indirect means jobs at companies that supply materials and equipment to the building of the pipeline. And imputed jobs refers uh, to jobs, again, supported by the money those workers will spend at other places. In other words, a pipeline worker gets their paycheck, go in, go, they go into town, they buy themselves a new pair of work boots, uh, take themselves out to dinner at a restaurant. The, um, the salesperson at the shoe store is regarded as an imputed job along with the wait staff at the restaurant. Now what's more? The report, after saying all this, not there, but on the next page it says this, it gets around to defining what it means by a job, which turns out is, quoting, one position that is filled for one year. Since the project is estimated to take two years to complete, that means they're not talking about 42,000 jobs, but 21,000 jobs, only 1,950 of which will be in actually constructing the pipeline, little more than a fifth of what TransCanada is claiming and less than a tenth of what the company had claimed just a year earlier. But then get this, the report qualifies even that by saying that the term support, remember I told you to remember that term, the term support includes jobs that are already presently filled but would be directed towards support of the pipeline project. In other words, this, this ever-shrinking number of jobs is not even additional jobs. It includes people who are already employed. And to cap the climax, which is a Great old expression. I love that expression. To cap the climax, after the thing is built, after the, all those construction and support jobs disappear, how many jobs would this pipeline require in the United States, according to the State Department report? 50. You got that right. 5-0. 50. 35 permanent jobs and 15 temporary contractors. And frankly, I find it very interesting. When it's talking about the 42,000 supported jobs, the report goes on and on about all the money this is going to pump through the economy, all the economic benefit of having all of these people working and all this money going through. But when it gets down to the 50 jobs, oh, well, then it just reassuringly says that, oh, such a small number will have negligible impacts on, like, housing stock and public services. In other words, in each case, it addresses the thing that makes the pipeline sound the best. Now, opponents of this pipeline have not given up. On the day the State Department report came out, a call went out for vigils to express opposition to the pipeline. Three days later, thousands of people turned out for over 250 vigils that covered all 50 states. Some vigils had just a few people, others had several hundred or more than a thousand. There were already being plans laid for court challenges to the pipeline and for large-scale civil disobedience should Obama approve the project. Thing is, no matter how much those who Teddy Roosevelt called the malefactors of great wealth, those curses to the country, he said, who sacrificed everything to getting wealth, everything here including the future of the planet, no matter how much those people just want us to give up and go away, we are not going to. We're going to take a break. All right, and we're back. And although the last thing I said really wasn't an update, this one really is. Uh, some weeks ago, uh, I denounced a bill in the Senate that uh, proposed to move the goalpost on negotiations with Iran over its nuclear program. Uh, that was a, uh, the bill, because I said, would, would very likely result in a breakdown of negotiations. Now, I think as those negotiations, if I've noted several times, amount to a, mo a group of mostly Western nations bullying Iran over its nuclear program. Bullying which, if it were directed at us, political leaders here would denounce as the grossest affront to our national interest and our sovereignty and our national rights and would probably provoke daily calls for war. But thing is here no matter. We're sort of between the proverbial rock and a hard place uh, the, because the failure of those negotiations would in the current climate very likely dramatically increase the chances of a military attack on Iran. So the success of these negotiations uh, is clearly the better or the less bad option 
available to us. So it was good news, uh, as I noted last week, that the move to pass that bill had stalled uh, to the point where even the rabidly pro-Israel uh, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC, gave up on pushing it and said it's better to wait and see what happens with the negotiations. Apparently, however, some people do not want to give peace a chance. Um, 42 senators, every one of them a gopper, signed a letter to Senate Majority uh, Leader Harry Reid demanding that he allow a floor vote on this bill. Because uh, if he doesn't, according to the Daily Beast, they are planning to make his life miserable by using every parliamentary trick in the book to bring it up over and over again, even to the point, perhaps, of filibustering every other piece of legislation and letting uh, having a vote on this bill be the price for letting anything else happen in the Senate. So, where are we at? The White House says this bill will blow up the negotiations. Iran says the bill will blow up the negotiations. AIPAC says there should not be a vote at this time in the measure. Bob Menendez, one of the original sponsors of the bill, now says diplomacy should have time to work. But the right wing doesn't care. Now, I don't know if they're, if they're taking this attitude because they actually want a war with Iran, although some of them, such as Senator John Bomb 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 Iran uh, uh, McCain, gives every indication of wanting precisely that. But I don't know if they actually want a war with Iran, or they just figure passing the bill will embarrass Obama and damn the consequences. Which means either they are bloodthirsty warmongers, or they are amazingly stupid. Now it's time for one of our regular and one of our favorite features around here, the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. The, uh, the winner of the Big Red Nose this week is the Drug-Free America Foundation, which brought down on itself the mockery of the entire internet when it tweeted the question, what happens if marijuana is legalized, and answered its own question with this. The DFAF in this poster cites neither studies nor data, but simply claimed that legalization would double or triple the total number of users, and what's more, would trigger the zombie apocalypse. Except maybe it's not an apocalypse because these are lazy zombies, which seems to run counter to the basic notion of a zombie, but since we've already seen that tightly reasoned arguments are not the DFAF strong point, I guess lazy zombies can fit right in there. And when pressed by Tom Angle of the reform group Marijuana Majority and Jack Healy of the New York Times for supporting data, DFAF first cited an outfit called UnmaskingMarijuana.org, which seems to be a compilation of every anti-marijuana paper, comment, or statement in existence. And when that source didn't overawe people, it turned to, quoting its own tweet, do the research yourself, we have and you know it's true. In other words, we can't prove our case, so you you go out and prove it for us. Uh, Mason Zvert, uh, communications director for the Marijuana Policy Project, responded by saying, if they truly believe what they're saying about marijuana, it wouldn't surprise me if they actually truly believe in real zombies. Uh, and perhaps, in fact, the zombie apocalypse, uh, at least for DFAF, since a recent Gallup poll showed a, showed a clear majority, 58% of Americans favoring legalization of marijuana, including a majority of every age group from 18 to 64. Now, I mentioned before that legalization is something I support uh, and which I think is coming, but it's not high on my personal list of political priorities. But I do suspect that legalization may come sooner rather than later, particularly if the opposition to it comes from outfits like the Drug Free America Foundation, who are on current evidence a bunch of clowns. All right, we're going to wrap up. Last thing for today, and we'll see how long uh, this goes. Um, this is about, this is, um, it's the outrage of the week, okay? It's the outrage of the week. And, but the thing is, it's not a single outrage. It's sort of a compilation of, of outrages that lead to a single sort of conclusion. Something I've actually talked about before, uh, and I'm sure will again, but it just, let's just say it's kind of like a perfect storm of evidence. It just recently, again, 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 the Senate was unable to pass an extension of unemployment benefits. Uh, 
Uh, the last time they said at least five Republicans needed to vote for it in order to get through the filibuster, uh, four did. And the bill failed 58 to 40. And the thing is here, even if the Senate eventually does somehow manage to pass this extension of unemployment benefits, Republican leaders in the House haven't even talked about bringing it up for a vote at all. And this is happening at a time when a still record number of Americans are long-term unemployed. Right now, 3.9 million Americans have been unemployed for six months or longer. Now, this is a little down from the peak of 4.1 million. But still, this is kind of numbers are unprecedented in our history. And the thing is about this bill, here's something about this bill, the last version of this extension of unemployment benefits. Uh, the, the right-wingers and the Senate have been saying all along, well, the deal was they wanted this bill to be paid for. They want it to be paid for. They want it the cost here to be covered by some cost, cost reduction there, by some other thing there. And it was paid for. And they didn't care. They filibustered it anyway. The, they re, the Goppers said they wanted to be able to offer amendments to the bill. They were given the opportunity to offer amendments to the bill. They didn't care. Right now, something approaching one and a half million Jobless Americans have lost all of their extended benefits. They have been six weeks, sometimes more, without any of these benefits. And this, again, it is a time when we are facing record numbers of unemployed, long-term unemployed. Not just one thing, not just one thing. That was just point one. All right, point two, you want to get to the second one? And this one just, I'm sorry, this, I find this so incredibly offensive, I find it hard to, I find it hard to talk about it. Food stamps, or SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. A House Senate conference report just cut a little more than $8 billion over the next 10 years from the SNAP program. At a time when hunger is still an issue, at a time when we, child poverty in this country is one of the highest in the entire industrialized world, when hunger is still a major issue, we're cutting an incredibly successful program. The food stamp program has been one of the most successful federal programs. It has clearly, dramatically, measurably reduced hunger in the United States. And probably that's one of the reasons that these right-wingers are against it, because it works. Now, admittedly, this $8 billion cut was a lot less than, than the, the right-wingers wanted. The House Republicans, they voted for a $39 billion cut. But let's not forget that the Senate Democrats, they also wanted to cut it. And so the argument at a time when, again, hunger is still real, unemployment is still real, millions, tens of millions of people are struggling, child poverty remains high, poverty remains high, they were arguing not over whether or not to cut food stamps, but how much to cut food stamps. And in fact, the, 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 the conservatives were, were arguing that they grouse over the farm bill, which is, the food stamps are included, they're a Department of Agriculture program, so they were included in this farm bill. Um, and the Republicans are grousing that in this bill that SNAP got cut, cut too much and farm commodity supports, uh, 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 I'm sorry, that SNAP got cut too little and farm commodity supports got cut too much. This cut could mean as much as a $90 a month cut in, uh, in benefits for some 850,000 of our poorest citizens. And remember, this is on top, this is on top of the $5 billion cut in the program that took place back on November 1st, which was the fault of Obama and the Democrats because they borrowed money from a stimulus program that was supposed to pay for this and never put it back. That was their fault. But then again, on top of this, the right-wingers, they want to add insult to injury. They want to cut the food stamps, and then they're turning around and they're saying, all right, a dozen uh, right-wingers in the House have introduced a bill to say that people who use the federal food stamp program have to show a photo ID when they buy their food. 
They said, oh, the basis for this, they said, is that a recent Government Accountability Office report found that $2.2 billion in food stamps were improperly handed out back in 2009, which, of course, has nothing to do with, fo with a photo ID. Photo ID won't have anything to do with that. But the thing is, they know... They know, they have to know, that a lot of these poor people don't have photo IDs. And they won't be able to use the benefits. And because, just like voting, what did they say? They said, it's to protect the integrity of the program. To protect the integrity of the program. Just like, they, just like the lies they spread, uh, they spread about voters in order to justify their voter ID that would cut out so many poor people. It's about the integrity of the program. No, it's about you wanting to cut people off and leave them adrift. And then here's the one. On top, okay, this, this is the third of my like, perfect storm, and this may be the worst because I, I just can't understand why this actually is an issue. Although, actually, I do. I'll get to that in a minute. The minimum wage. Two recent polls, a Quinnipiac poll, a Quinnipiac poll rather, and a Pew Research Center USA poll. They both say voters want minimum wage increased. Every Democrats do, independents do, even a majority of Republicans, self-identified Republicans, say they support an increase in the minimum wage, and still it is not happening. The federal minimum wage today is seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. If it had kept pace just with inflation since 1991, it would be over $12 an hour. If it had kept uh, pace with worker gains in productivity since the peak value of, of, uh, of um, uh, the minimum wage, which was back in 1968, if it had kept pace with increases in worker productivity in that time, it would now be nearly $22 an hour. The fact is, right now, some 3.6 million people are working at or below the minimum wage. That's roughly the population of Los Angeles. And what's more, millions more have their pay actually tied in some way to the minimum wage. You raise the minimum wage, you don't just benefit those 3.6 million people, you actually benefit nearly 28 million workers who have a better life and a better chance to advance themselves. And the this nonsense that uh, raising the minimum wage kills jobs, it doesn't. In fact, there was just a letter recently from 600 economists who said that, no, it doesn't. It does not kill jobs. In fact, the proposal now to raise the minimum wage to just $10.10 an hour, which is still less than it should be, but raise it just $10.10 an hour would reduce the number of people living in poverty by f over 4.5 million. So why isn't it happening? I'll tell you why it's not happening. Because of one other thing. It is a stealth taxpayer subsidy to the fast food and restaurant industry. Because these, these McWorkers, as they become called, they are paid safety net benefits out of taxpayer funds. They're paid like for food stamps and other things because they don't make enough at their jobs. It's an equivalent to a $7 billion subsidy for this industry. That's why it's not happening. It's the utter, complete, rank selfishness justified by self-serving fantasies about the moral and ethical shortcomings of those lower on the economic scale than you. The belief that hungry people are crooks, unemployed people are lazy, low-wage workers have no ambition, poor people have no worth ethic, ethic. It is just justifications of selfishness and greed. And I'm going to talk more about this next week. But for now, I'm running out of voice and I'm running out of time. And you have the best week you possibly can. Peace.